Mary Boykin Miller was born on March 31, 1823, in Statesburg, South Carolina, to a prominent family. She was the oldest child of her mother, also named Mary Boykin Miller, the daughter of a wealthy plantation-owning family. Thus, Mary grew up in a world in which she was the elite. Her family had numerous slaves and acres of land. Mary's father, Stephen Miller, established himself as an active lawyer and politician and was elected governor in 1828. He proceeded to be elected as a U.S. Senator in 1830. Stephen Miller was influential in the founding of the South Carolina States' Rights Party, a true champion of states' rights and nullification. Mary's childhood is central to understanding her political knowledge because she grew up in an environment in which politics were central to her life. Her father exposed her as a young girl to the enthusiasm of state legislature's meetings. He also made sure that Mary would receive a proper education. As a South Carolina woman, Mary was not only expected to learn the subjects of classics, history, foreign languages, and art, she was also trained to become a proper wife. Mary was sent to a boarding school in Charleston, one of the finest in the country. Therefore, Mary not only obtained political knowledge from her father, she was also fortunate enough to receive an outstanding education. She was the star pupil in the school that she went to in Charleston, Madame Taupin's school. And I think if you um, look at English boarding schools over the last century, you know that if you graduate from a, a good English boarding school, you've got the equivalent of an American college education. So the standard for this little school in Charleston was very high. Uh, she spoke seven languages, she read military history, she read the classics, uh, she, she was uh, a brilliant student and scholar to begin with. Secondly, because she had no children, she retreated into a world of books. So she really was an intellectual. It was the marriage to a true Southern gentleman, James Chestnut, which marked the end of Mary's childhood. Mary and James were married on April 23, 1840. After their marriage, James and Mary moved to Mulberry Plantation, the home of the Chestnut family in Camden, South Carolina. The year of 1840 also marked when James would begin his political career. James Chestnut was one of the most powerful individuals in Civil War South Carolina. He was a fire eater, as well as the first senator to resign his Senate seat. Once he seized power, Mary enjoyed the benefits of being married to a wealthy politician. She was able to continue a lavish lifestyle, as well as form relationships with some of the most influential leaders of the Civil War. One of the most important keys to understanding Mary Chestnut is that she and James were unable to bear children. One of the main duties of a Southern woman was to raise children, and the values of Mary's time embraced a wife who could provide her husband with many children. Mary struggled with her inability to have children, yet was still able to be the center of social and political gossip. And her being childless, I think, is the key thing, Jane. It's the key thing. Without, not only was she childless, but she grieved about being childless. It wasn't sort of a neutral issue. It allowed her to travel around with her husband as he was in the Confederate Army and then the government. Perhaps her inability to have children allowed her the time to read, write, and become involved with her husband's political endeavors. Even though it is known that her marriage to James was not always a happy one, it gave her enough time to write one of the most compelling and well-respected memoirs of the Civil War. Her diary gives insight to Southern culture, the issue of slavery, the elite planners, the political atmosphere, and the war itself. She and her husband had direct relations to the most important, influential leaders of the Civil War. Her life embodies the distinctiveness of South Carolina thinking, yet she herself was extremely independent and had an individualistic way of thinking. Many of her personal views, as seen in her diary, reflect the beliefs of the Confederacy, but many of the beliefs she holds also reject those of the Confederacy. Mary's education and background as a Southern woman, combined with her marriage to prominent South Carolinian James Chestnut, allowed her to form her own unique perspective regarding Southern life, in particular slavery. She was neither pro-slavery nor was she an abolitionist. Rather, Mary Chestnut had a complex view of slavery. She understood that it was not necessarily moral, but she also valued it as the backbone behind the culture of Southern society. She wrote in her diary, South Carolina slaveholder as I am, my very soul sickens. It is too dreadful. Which accurately describes her feeling for slavery. Neither she nor her husband cared for the institution, but they were accustomed to the riches it brought them. Mary Chestnut herself thought that slavery was a monstrous injustice. Furthermore, unlike most South Carolinians, she tried to improve the life of her slaves by teaching them how to read, which was illegal at the time. She was a free-thinking person, 
and she was able to contemplate through her good education and her understanding of the world stage that women's roles were very similar to the roles of enslaved people. Neither could vote, neither could own property, neither really had any control over their own lives. I think she would have been a great suffragette if she had been around, lived to see the beginning of, of the, the, the push for women's votes. So she saw slavery was wrong. She taught the slaves in her grandmother's home to read, which was against the law. But she also said, slavery must go and with it all joy. And what I would suggest to you there is that she was a person over time. And she enjoyed the, the, the life that provided people who looked after her. So you will see in, in the answer to this question and others, the complexity of this person. Even though Mary Chestnut despised the institution of slavery, she also had a great dislike of the North. She believed Northerners were ignorant of the Southern way of life, of which she so eagerly took part in. In November of 1861, Mary writes that, We are not as much of heathens down here as our enlightened enemies think. Their philanthropy is cheap. There are as noble pure lives here as there, and a great deal more self-sacrifice. Mary Chestnut also believed in the old South Carolina idea that Africans were naturally inferior to whites, calling them dirty, slatternly, idle, and ill-smelling by nature. Slavery allowed Mary Chestnut the opportunity to travel around with her husband and gave her the tremendous amount of time it took her to write her diary. Owing to her diary, Mary Chestnut is no longer just a part of South Carolina heritage. Instead, it has allowed her to become a national figure, while ironically, her husband has remained a state figure. I, and I think of her, with apologies, as a national figure. I think that we all, she belongs to all of us now, in that, um, you know, she talks about the Civil War, and she talks about the North, and really lucid. She's, she's not ever really celebrating or but sometimes she'll say, that education, that mode of education was, was superior or whatever. There'll be little, so she's, she's more ecumenical than most people. Most people are very partisan about the war. Mary Chestnut is not unlike Abraham Lincoln another national figure to emerge from the Civil War era. Lincoln was not born a national figure, he had to become one. He could have easily remained a local Illinois figure because of his differing opinions from those around him. He was an anomaly for his area because he believed in the equality of the races and wanted the abolition of slavery. However, he also embodied the spirit of the Illinois frontier, that hard work and education could allow one to advance and achieve the American dream. Mary Chestnut is quite similar to Abraham Lincoln, even though their opinions differ greatly. Her education played a large factor in her alternative view on slavery, much like Lincoln's education gave him a different view from those around him. Although Mary Chestnut despised Lincoln and thought of him ugly in nature, she, like Lincoln, was clearly ahead of her time. When Lincoln was assassinated and Andrew Johnson took over, she called, she said, now we're at the mercy of the drunken tailor. Right, and she knew that there was going to be vengeance upon the South, whereas Lincoln had promised justice and mercy for all in his 272 words, famous words in the, in the Gettysburg Address. So she knew that the South had lost their chance for mercy and for justice. Earlier on, when he arrives on the scene in, in, in his election in 1860, November, and her husband resigns his Senate seat and goes home to South Carolina to join the secession movement. Um, yes, she she's, relates stories that she hears, gossip that she hears, that he's grotesque, that he has a funny sense of humor. Um, and Stephen Douglas tells her, watch out, he's very, very clever. Um, and you're about to, to find out how clever he is. She had the ability to see the immorality of slavery in a place like South Carolina, where slavery was fully embraced, practiced, and defended. At one point in her diary, Mary writes, Slavery must go, and I'll joy with it. Which shows that Mary Chestnut understood that the world was changing around her. She understood that the Civil War was going to end the institution of slavery, and at the same time end the lifestyle her culture embraced. She says slavery must go and all, all joy with it, right? So what does that mean? That means, you know, she knows it's dying, it's, it's going to be dead. She knows that her life will be considerably less 
pleasant and uh, free without slave help. But she understands the imperative of history, in some sense, to um, move toward a more democratic form of being for people in the United States. After the war, Mary Chestnut entered the butter and egg business with her former slave Molly in order to support Mulberry Plantation. The publishing of her diary in 1885, followed by her death in November of 1886, marked the beginning of a new era in South Carolina and her rise to national prominence. She was one of the people who was able to face what was an epic tragedy for this country mm -hmm. and not go down fighting, holding on to a lost cause. She, after the war, her former slave Molly went down into the swamp and rounded up a bunch of cows and they started a dairy business on shares as business partners. And Molly was supporting her family and Mary Chestnut was supporting hers and it was a very shaky, fragile existence. But I think Mary Chestnut was able to make what, what I think of as a transformation. She was somebody who didn't hold on to the 